Hello, this is Writing for Audio. It is October 8th, 2017. My name is Stephen Campbell. I am the author of the Hard Luck Hank books and audiobooks. I am a member of SIFWA, that is the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. This video is primarily for professional and semi-professional writers uh, in SIFWA who want to write for audio or convert their books to audio or just explore that air, uh, avenue. Um, I'm not going to talk about much else except for writing for audio, but hopefully it can be of some use to you. Um, first, to dive right in, get yourself some text-to-speech software. Um, you'll hear so many errors that you don't see. Um, especially if you're rereading your book over and over again. Uh, your brain makes you scan, especially if you're a fast reader or if you've read it, like I said, many times. Uh, you'll see sentences or part of sentences or part of words and skip ahead because your brain knows or thinks it knows what is already there. Um, uh, my first novel, uh, the first sentence of my first novel is probably the sentence I have read most in my life. I worked on the book for years and I read the first sentence many, many times. And when I eventually uh, got it to an editor, I had a typo in the first sentence. Um, not a uh, incorrect word, but it was uh, not the word I intended. But I had read that sentence so many times I thought I knew what was there. Uh, that, so I just didn't actually read it. Um, there's a fundament, fundamental difference on how words read versus how they sound. Uh, some words are long syllables, uh, some short. Uh, depends on how many times you have to form your mouth, lips, and inhale, exhale. Um, my dog's name is Sasquatch. I would say couple times a week people ask me what I call them for short and I usually say it's two syllables um, they go do you call them sassy and I was like that's two syllables also but they're right um, Sasquatch is a long two syllables um, rock is a short one syllable word queen is a long one syllable word um, you just be aware that what things look like on the page and how someone is going to listen to them are very different. Um, letters like P and T tend to travel a bit. S hisses. Um, words that start with vowels can pick up uh, some of the other um, longer sounds. And if people are going to be listening to these, your audio works on phones or with mono speakers or in uh, noisy environments, it can be easy to uh, confuse what you're saying. Um, I'll ask you to consider two written words, P-O-P -P space A-L-L. -L. Um, you're never going to confuse that on a page. Uh, and let's say there's some reason to have those words together, like someone, a character is asked how many balloons you want to pop. Um, so that's never, reading that you would never be confused, but when you say it, pop all, um, that can be <laughs> a lot of different things. It could be P-A-W-P-A-W, -P -A -W. it could be P-A-U-L-A-L-L, -L -L. it could be uh, P A P A. Um, I bring this up because a number of times I've had the uh, narrator uh, redo um, some passages, not because they were incorrect, because they just sounded weird, and I hadn't picked it up even when I listened to it in text to speech. It's a problem with. Um, text-to-speech. It is done by computers, and if you got a space there, it's going to stick a space there, however many milliseconds is standard. Um, I had actually, in one case, lost a joke because uh, when you listen to it, it sounded like something different. The punchline sounded like something different 
and it still made sense. It just wasn't funny. <laughs> so instead of pop all, just pop everything or pop them all. Um, there's different ways to rewrite it if um, uh, it's getting confusing. Um, another example of that is in the TV show Family Guy. Um, during the intro musical scene, um, there's uh, the the baby Stewie says, you know, what sound like she holds up the baby. And what he sa he says, uh, what sounds like effing cry, um, and um, I had was talking to the executive producer years ago about that, and I don't know how it came up, but. Uh, I said, yeah, and effing cry, and he was like, he's not saying that. He must have heard that a number of times. Um, it's laugh and cry, um, but it sound if you listen to it, it sounds like effing cry. And he was like, we can't hint at that word effing. We can't. We'd never ha be able to have that in there. It's laugh and cry, and. These are professionals with the best equipment available, and I and apparently many other people thought it was effing cry. So yeah, that can happen. And if they w if if laugh and cry was important for you to know, um, as opposed to effing cry, you I would have lost that meaning. Um, I've I've changed um, other phrases because it ended with a. T or P and it merged in the following words and uh, uh, changed the meaning entirely. Um, so just uh, consider that. Um, uh, there's uh, equipment issues. Um, remember, you might not always have, your narrators might not always have the best recording equipment or best listening equipment. Uh, hopefully your, your professional narrators do. Um, I'll touch on this a bit later, but having a character whose name is P.S. 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 an alien name, and another character who is named T.C. 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 Uh, you would never confuse that on the page. Um, very different, very obvious. Um, but to a listener, it, they sound identical. It's static. <laughs> so. Again, I'll get into that later, but um, uh, literary versus understandable. Um, I love uh, flowery, proficient writing. I ad admire it. Um, you hear a great phrase and you carry it around with you, um, and you appreciate the <laughs> English language and the author's skill for coming up with those um, phrases, but they're different when you're listening to them. Um, uh, semicolons, convoluted sentences, um, this is a big difference uh, in audio versus uh, uh, on the page. People can reread passages over and over again. Um, I think the likelihood of people reversing in audio to re-listen to something is a lot less than the number of times you can just skip around or skip back and say you didn't quite get that word or the meaning of that sentence. Um, I was reading a physics book that was supposedly for lay people. Um, years ago and I'm staring at some gigantic paragraph and I can't understand the rest of the chapter until I figure out this paragraph and I was um, taking pillows out and putting objects on them trying to make sense of what this brilliant physicist who was a terrible writer was trying to explain to me um, and again, I could do that. I could stop and make uh, 3D demonstrations of trying to understand this run-on, uh, I think it was a sentence, but it was 
half a page or something um, and people are just you know this recording is going on and they're probably not going to stop and go back um, they don't have access to a dictionary or encyclopedia like you do in a uh, many readers nowadays you can press on a word or highlight it and look it up um, I think back to reading some of the early pulp uh, stuff or um, 19th 18th century and they'll stick in some cool Latin French phrases and uh, obscure topics um, and um, maybe you can carry that with you or you can certainly look it up nowadays but it, it's harder to see someone taking off their earphones, getting up, going, writing it down, going to the computer, and, and looking up what you're talking about. <laughs> um, so keep that in mind. Um, alliteration really sounds bad and obvious. Um, the book belongs back on the bed, Barney. If someone said that in real life, they're going to go, ha-ha, or, you know, it's going to be a joke. If someone regularly talked in alliteration and never pointed it out, you'd think they're a freak. <laughs> it's really strange. Um, if I said, you know, book belongs back on the red Barney, the Barney is going to stop and say, did you, did you mean to do that? Or, are you just really weird? Um, so... Again, the, I, I put in uh, alliteration in my writing, and it's I do it to be goofy. I do it to be, look at this, this is silly. Um, but it does stick out. Um, it's easy to repeat words in your writing, um, especially if you pick up in a chapter, um, you know, you went halfway through, and so you reread to get back in the uh, mood and bring yourself back up to speed and it's easy to repeat words um, and it's not as noticeable on the page in my opinion um, I was just reading something uh, a couple days ago and it, it wasn't an incredible word so I, I say it was incredible um, I think within two sentences um, they might have been the same sentence they used the word incredible um, and I noticed it um, incredible isn't a ten dollar word inflation um, but uh, people do pick up that but when you say it when you hear it it I think it really hits home a lot more um, if I say it's sacrilegious to write an audio book like that um, and another a sentence later, say, and it's sacrilegious to not write an audio book like this. People are going to go, did, did he just learn that word? Why, why is he saying sacrilegious so much? Um, you just, it, it really sticks out. If you said that in a conversation, it would really stick out. Um, so be aware that. Um, repeating words uh, even on the same page if they are like sacrilegious or a uh, little more uncommon I, I had a um, I think I said uh, at one point I, instead of he said she said I had uh, the character sneezed like I, he just uh, um, I, I wanted him to kind of spit out that uh, Phrase and I think I used it again within a couple pages, and I was like, "Wow, well, I, I got to get rid of this." Um, why is he sneezing? Um, uh, word echoes. Um, my editor spots these a lot. Words that sound similar can be really clunky when spoken. Um, it doesn't have to be alliteration. You say have some like show. Show the boat the flow of growth, <laughs> something like that. And if you look at it, and you, if you read it, um, it's different than hearing it. You, you're making sing-song poetry. Um, it just really clubs you. Uh, so be careful of that. You know, if you have enough and 
uh, rough and it's tough. You know, it doesn't even have to rhyme, but um, it really comes across when you hear it. Um, so uh, there's no visual cues in audio, <laughs> uh, in realism and naming. Um, this is a big pet peeve of mine. Um, so there's no visual cues in audio. Um, this, what I mean by this is uh, we do skim a lot. Let's say if uh, you have two brothers, two characters, and their names are G, S, A, D, 15 other characters, ends in a Z. And uh, G, A, S, D, 15 other characters, and ends with an A. Um, people reading that are going, I say very often, they're going to scan it and say, oh, it's the G-A-Z guy, or the G-A-A guy, and the Z guy is the jerk, and the A guy is the rightful heir, or whatever. Um, but in audio, they have to listen to those whole names. Uh, your narrator has to say them every time. Um, and every once in a while people are going to get confused I, I think um, unless that Z and that A really pops you know if you're listening to that eight syllable name you're going okay who is this you know, and then yeah it's Z um, and names are, are really easy to butcher um, <laughs> uh, for your narrator uh, make sure they don't become jokes by mistake uh, <laughs> I, I wrote down as an example uh, Ellie space butes this <laughs> the butt the stank you know um, you can pronounce that many different ways um, and on the page it doesn't look as bad when you say it it can be ridiculous um, so make sure that um, your names can't be butchered so bad that it, it kills your work. Um, <sighs> Tolkien, I think, kind of did this. Um, uh, you know, people want to put in their high elven and orcish and Flor Dorpian um, languages and passages. Uh, if people are reading it and they're not into that kind of world building, uh, they can just skip it or scan it. Um, you don't need to know how to speak Elvish uh, to understand and appreciate uh, Lord of the Rings or something. You can, or whatever. You can just skip ahead. But in audio, you can't skip it. There's no visual cue to see italics in some giant format and go, eh, I'm going to go to the end of that. So you got to sit there and listen to it, and it's going to turn off potentially some listeners uh, so be careful with that um, and in general uh, about the confusing uh, names and uh, languages I ask you to uh, consider a, a very successful science fiction series and how they did alien names um, some of the names they used were Vulcan and Klingon and Romulan and Borg. Um, what are the chances a, a cybernetic alien species is called Borg? Uh, it was the first race they assimilated uh, cavemen or something. Uh, but you don't really think about it. Um, and it works. You don't have to have 30 character names to be realistic, you know, to make it alien. Um, and my, again, this is a big pet peeve, which is why I'm going off on it, but it's no more realistic that an alien species would have a 30 syllable name than a three syllable name. And the chances of a completely alien species having the same vocal cord structure as us, the same hearing structures us it seems really remote to me they might communicate with ultra red or uh, infrared uh, blinks or dragons shifting their wings around um, 
as opposed to just really long names. Um, so I, I think you can, I, I have made some, when I came up with races and everything, I was thinking, okay, this is a, this is not Earth, it's not future Earth, past Earth, it's not our universe. Somehow they're, I am translating this um, into English for the readers. Um, so make it easy. I mean, even if you go on our planet, you have languages where they don't have the L, the letter L, or they trill their R's, or they have umlauts, where they breathe in to make sounds. But it seems like our go-to for alien complicated uh, or, you know, elvish or orcish is just long. We just make our words long. Um, uh, I'd say re even reading like uh, Chaucer from 700 years ago is very difficult. Um, yet a 10,000-year-old dragon speaks perfect modern English. We're, we're taking some leaps um, already, so, you know, don't maybe you think it adds realism, but I, I hate those things. And your narrator is going to hate you if you have a book full of insane language and your readers can't skim, to, or your audio listeners can't skim or skip it. They have to sit through your page of elvish dialogue or, or Klingon speak. Um, again, this is a pet peeve, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so I, I used to do things like um, even avoid talking about anything Earth, um, like saying something was mouse-like. I was like, well, I don't have that word. But I, I gave that up just because, like I said, I'm translating this somehow. So when I say mouse, really that's a Gishnorkian, but it's close to a mouse, and I'm doing a translation for my readers there. Um, I do avoid idioms um, because that, I think, pulls uh, readers and listeners out a bit more, if you say, cheaper by the dozen, or, you know, um, the whole nine yards or something. But um, I, I think dancing around every English word um, or whatever language you happen to be uh, writing in, I think, is unnecessary. Um, your narrator has to physically say these words. Um, that means they have to take breaths, uh, pause, uh, they ramp up for hard parts. Um, I had a character, uh, have a character whose name is ZZZHO, and I had kind of wanted it to be a quick um, so, uh, but my my narrator, uh, bless his heart, uh, kind of turns that into like four syllables, and um, so every time that character comes up, he's a recurring character. He kind of has to build himself up for it. So you have this sentence that's flowing, and he's like, "All right, there's that word." I mean, <laughs> gets the breath, and pauses, and it can kind of break the rhythm of what you're listening to, um, you know, and if you have some orcish names that are all caps and screaming out guttural, your narrator has to physically do that, and um, so if you're talking and you even have, uh, you know, this orcish character said, you know, the narrator has to say that, and uh, if it's some brutal uh, word, you know, it it does kind of break up the uh, rhythm of the cadence of your uh, work. Um, the same concept to poetry, uh, songs, uh, things of that nature, not everyone is into it. Um, I tend to not read very often uh, poetry in uh, books because many times, in my opinion, uh, they're just, these writers aren't very good poets. You know, poets are, are a specialized form of writer. Um, 
I respect them for what they can do, and not every writer can do that. Um, so I, I generally skip it, but again, because it's audio, you don't, you can't see. Oh, it's eight seconds ahead or 38 seconds ahead. I get to skip, so you have to listen to it. Um, and not everyone wants to listen to it. Um, uh, attributions. Um, he said, she said. Uh, don't uh, be careful when you have a lot of speaking characters interacting. Um, he said, she said, John said, Bob said, um, it becomes really a lot harder if it's a ten syllable elven name said. Um, if your narrator is using different voices, um, uh, has uh, accents for this character, or uses a female voice for this character, a gruff male voice for this character. Um, when you have those sentences, and then John said, or Orcish Bob said, the narrator breaks back out into his or her na speaking narrator voice to say that. And um, it is difficult to do those transitions and the audio doesn't need all those attributions as much because if your narrator is using voices you can hear it um, you can that that's a definite plus um, but you do have to so it's, it's redundant to have every single line having he said she said because we can hear um, who is speaking but uh, be careful because if the narrator does get confused, you know, if you have uh, three people speaking uh, and a couple pages of dialogue, um, again, when you're reading, you can go back and if you get confused, go, okay, Bob, Joe, Bob, Joe, Bob, Joe. Um, but they might not have, the, the narrator um, might get broken up and uh, start giving the wrong attributions and using the wrong voices um, and so then you'll have to get that corrected um, don't have for that reason don't have the same characters speak multiple lines in a row without attribution or you're going to confuse your narrator um, the narrator don't assume the narrator is really reading for enjoyment um, your book, uh, or books, work, whatever. Um, they're doing the characters, they're, they're pursuing it in a different fashion. Um, so if I'm ever concerned that the narrator is going to be confused, I make sure to have something there. This is really important if you have recurring characters um, and someone comes back from a hundred pages ago, the narrator might not know that or might not remember that because, again, they're viewing the book differently. Um, books, audiobooks can be like nine hours, um, ten hours, twelve hours, whatever. There, there's going to be mistakes. Um, always proofread what your narrator turns in. Um, and I haven't mentioned this yet get these um, in addition to using voice uh, text to voice using these is, is very uh, powerful you got your speakers a half inch from your ear you cancel your ambient noise uh, it's very very helpful um, if your narrator uses voices be aware they only have so many voices. If you have 150 speaking characters, they're not going to have 150 different voices. No one has that many voices. Um, consolidate some of these uh, speaking parts if they aren't needed or you're going to have voices repeated over and over again and they're not going to be distinctive. You're going to burn your narrator out. He or she might not remember um, the voices they've used already in the book. Um, so yeah, I, I did say this, putting clues that this is the guy we met back at the airport, 
um, or whatever. If you have to create a, a complicated Bible to give uh, to a narrator so that it can properly do your book, it's probably too complicated. Um, unless you're a top tier author paying your narrator buku bucks, narrators have a lot of jobs to do and they get paid to do this and they got to make a living and spending six months on your book uh, probably isn't that profitable. Um, your book should be the script. It should be the only script that a narrator needs to properly produce your book. That's my opinion. Unless something is absolutely necessary, um, like you have a, a confusing uh, alien name and you want to make sure that's known because it matters. Um, but uh, I, I generally try not to turn in anything in addition to the book. Uh, that should be enough. Um, for audio, people are often multitasking. Uh, I get this a lot. People say I help them on their drive or help them while they're working, uh, my, my works. Um, so put in uh, reminders, um, not just for the narrator. It's good to have reminders of characters or incidents that uh, your readers or listeners might have forgotten because people listening to audiobooks are more distracted, I think, on a whole than readers of uh, your books because, um, and again, you, you don't have the visual cue, uh, clues and cues and you can't just go back, uh, what was this, uh, seven chapters ago to try and look up something. Um, so, um, it, you know, if a book, if your audio book takes up 100% of their brain power um, to process what's going on in your audio book, your listeners are going to drive off the road and kill themselves, and you just lost a, a potential customer. Um, there's distractions and noise they have to deal with. Um, they can rewind, but again, I think that's a lot more rare than reading. I, I read all the time, and my mind will wander or something, and just reread the paragraph. It's not a big deal. Um, I very rarely do that with an audio book. Um, you just kind of forge ahead. Um, it's like a song, you know, and you have great parts you like in a song, but if you're driving, you it's, I think it's rare that you go back 30 seconds to listen to that part again. Um, think about yourself driving. Um, there's my dog walking by. Um, and uh, trying to make sense of uh, your own work and how difficult or undifficult it would be. Um, if you're unsure of some passages, um, put on some headphones and walk around your your home, clean up a bit, and see if you can make sense of it. You know, that's what I was talking about with the physics book, um, a layman's physics book, a layperson's physics book, and <laughs> having to sculpt, uh, you know, teaching aids to get through it. Um, you might want people's undivided attention, but I want a pony in a rocket ship, and I can't always get it. Um, can't always get it. Can't ever get it. Um, if your work requires pure uh, dedication, there's going to be some reader, listeners who tune out, and you lose them, even if they love your writing. Um, uh, getting back on uh, narrators just a bit um, this is my singing voice I'm singing right now I was the only kid in uh, elementary school who couldn't get into chorus because the teacher kept hitting different keys on the piano and I kept singing the same note um, there's I know uh, writers get kind of annoyed when uh, you, you say you're a writer and someone says, oh, I, I 
been thinking about putting a book together. Or I've uh, never written anything before, and I have no interest much in writing, never uh, tried it, but, you know, might as well give it a shot. It's kind of demeaning. It's like uh, me saying, well, it's, uh, it's summer. I um, uh, decided to try some brain surgery. Um, I've always been kind of interested in brains, and I, I got a brain, and uh, maybe just see how it goes and um, do it part time, get a little extra money, and maybe I'll like it. You know, you get an expert to do things that are difficult. Um, uh, writing is difficult. You want an expert. Narrating is difficult, and you want a professional. Um, there are people who grew up doing voices, um, not just. Darth Vader and uh, Daffy Duck, but a lot of voices, um, and they're good at it. Um, I know this voice is, is tough to listen to. I'm sorry, um, I'm doing the best I can, but I wouldn't dream of narrating my own works. And I encourage you uh, to, to hire a professional. Um, uh, some compromises. I, I I know I'm. It seems like I'm recommending you kind of dumb down your writing to make it uh, audio friendly, but it is a, a very different uh, format. Um, there are movies sometimes I see, and I can tell right away it started as a theatrical play because it flows and behaves differently than a movie. Um, it's just, uh, you know, just talking heads, just the way they talk and everything. Um, there probably hasn't been a hundred percent percent faithful movie or TV show from a book ever because it's a different medium. Um, audio is slightly different way of telling your written stories. Um, I grew up with uh, my parents reading stories to me as a kid and what I recalled the most from that time is was the Greek mythology and that makes sense because uh, those were probably came from an oral tradition, you know, um, and uh, I was getting it in the same format that it was uh, meant to be created in. Um, it, it doesn't take uh, a lot to make your books enjoyable in multiple formats, and I think you can do it without hurting your work. You do just have to be um, aware of the restrictions on it, what things sound like, how it flows, the cadence, and um, <laughs> again, just don't don't kill people with um, your your elvish and <laughs> North Dorpian language inserts. Um, so that's it for uh, writing for audio. I hope you found this uh, useful and um, you can now stop listening to my voice. <laughs>